Good, good morning. He's giving me, it's like hand signals. It's like, take one, we'll swing away. Oh, gotcha. Good morning and welcome to those who are watching uh, online and watching from Wichita, Salina, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Fairway. Um, my name is Rob Samari. I'm really uh, delighted today to introduce uh, a, a hometown guest, uh, a, a, a one of our candidates for the School of Nursing Dean position, Dr. Cindy Teal. Um, as as everybody in this room knows, uh, Cindy is the uh, Associate Direct Dean of the School of Nursing and the Director of the Graduate Programs. Um, I've got a glimpse of the slides behind me, so I'm going to spare you the biographical details because I think Cindy's going to walk through in much more important um, comments than, than I could make. But Cindy's been working her way east uh, to Kansas City for a long time now, and she got here in 1993 and has been on the faculty and has ridden, risen through the steps to her current position uh, as, as Associate Dean for the School of Nursing. Uh, Cindy plays very important local, uh, regional, state, and national roles in uh, undergraduate and graduate nursing. And so we're delighted that she shared an interest in, uh, in the search. And we're really looking forward to her talk. Cindy, welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. This is such a privilege and honor to be able to be here among friends and colleagues and share a little bit about myself with you. I've, as, as Dr. Samari just mentioned, I've worked here at KU for over 20 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, you know how time flies when you're having fun and it definitely has been a really great um, experience over these 20 years of um, having lots of different experiences, learning how to be a faculty member, how to be a researcher, how to be a team member, um, lots of lessons over those uh, that time. But I thought what it might be interesting um, as I share my journey with you is to give you a little bit of insight into how I came to be here. And so I'm going to start with um, my being raised in California. I'm a Los Angeles girl and I was raised in Southern California and then went to Northern California for uh, additional schooling. So speaking of school, this is a picture of my high school and it's Palos Verdes High School and was in an absolutely beautiful location. And so I, you know, I grew up with the ocean right next door and, and um, that feeling of outdoors and connection with nature has is, is been something that's been very important to me um, all my life. And, and when I found this picture online, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to share that with you. Um, it, it was a wonderful place to begin my education. And interestingly enough, when I was in high school and thinking about nursing, I had an algebra teacher who, who let me know that he didn't think I would be successful in nursing, so I really should pick something else. And I'm, I'm I guess, somewhat stubborn, so I took that as a really a good challenge, and I ensured that I moved forward in nursing. So I first started at, at UCLA. It was right across town and really great university, and I, I loved it there. But eventually um, moved north up to the Bay Area around San Francisco. And at that time, California State University Hayward was the name. It's now since been called East Bay. It is on the East Bay, so right across the Bay from San Francisco. And they had, at the time, a five-year baccalaureate program. So I thought that was going to be great, and I would get a wonderful education. And I did, except what I realized is that fifth year was basically an unpaid preceptorship. So that, that was um, something to discover. And, and that five-year program for baccalaureate degrees really didn't catch on. So we don't see too many of those across the country anymore. But that's, that was the experience that I had. And then following graduation from nursing school, I, like many of you, um, took a first job in um, med surge units and got 
um, fell in love with the, the high pace, the energy of working in an acute care setting, and, and I just loved it. But at that point, my husband wanted to move to Nevada, to Reno, Nevada, so I said, eventually, I said, well, all right. Um, took a little while, and at one point I got a call from the realtor, and she said, you know, your husband just called me and asked me to list your house. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I guess it's time to go now. So we, we, we both moved to Reno, and our house was just about 20 miles from, you probably recognize Lake Tahoe. This is Emerald Bay at Lake Tahoe. And it, again, absolutely beautiful environment. And something that, that's very important to me is stay connected with the outside environment in addition to our internal environments. So I worked, when I went to, to Reno, um, as often happens, I went to apply for a job at the hospital. And they said, uh, at the University Medical Center, and they said, well, we only have, we don't have a job in med surge, we only have a job in neurology. And I didn't know that much about neuroscience, but I um, said, okay, we'll, we'll have a go at this. And so I joined the neuroscience unit and fell in love with that. And so I decided I needed to go back to school again at that point. So I went to the University of Nevada, Reno, which is in the foreground of this picture. Um, the back is Reno. Um, and so while I was there, at that time, they had interesting program in advanced practice. They prepared both CNS and, and simultaneous NP. So when I finished that program, I was a nurse practitioner in adolescent health at um, a job corps while I was also a clinical nurse specialist in the neuroscience unit. And so it was an interesting um, time to go back and forth between more individual patient care and a larger system-based care. And I finally came to the conclusion I can't do both, and so I'm going to have to pick one, and I decided I'd have a larger influence with the CNS role. So I um, I went to that full time and really began to become fascinated with the intricacies of systems development. Um, and, and so we created a, a rehab unit. We were doing a really good job on the neurotrauma side, and we needed a rehab unit, so we created that. But what I found out in working in this neuroscience setting was that patients had had these terrible injuries, and, and they, the, they would have um, forever changed uh, as far as maybe mobility or cognition or both. Um, and, and some of the families, in response to those very significant changes, did okay. And, and they, it's almost like they rose to the challenge and they were able to, to manage the patient and their loved one um, following that, that incredibly difficult um, trauma. Other families, on the other hand, with a similar kind of, of trauma would absolutely fall apart. And, and the, if it was a child, the parents would divorce and just a, a whole cascade of, of negative outcomes. And so I, I was very curious about this. What is it that explains this um, response to significant loss? Because I saw such differences and I, I didn't understand how I maybe could predict who, who might need, need more care earlier or what I could do about that. So I knew that I needed a doctoral education and their uh, University of Arizona, how many of us have graduated from there? Yes, hands go up in the room. Um, University of Arizona has a uh, terrific doctoral program. So I decided to um, go to Arizona and, and apply for the doctoral program. And it, at that admission process, the uh, dean for admissions asked me, well, what musical instrument do you play? At the, uh, I said, well, I played piano for a while. Um, and she said, well, we have found that students um, who play a musical instrument do better than students who don't. So we wanted to see what kind of student you were going to be. <laughs> so I, I haven't gotten any better on the piano, but I thought that was an interesting way of interviewing at, at um, time of application. I don't know if you all had the same experience, Martha or Karen, but 
Yeah, yeah, it, it was interesting. So that, that idea of how to predict um, or how we could understand more about human response to significant loss threaded through um, my inquiry during the doctoral program at the University of Arizona and became the topic of my dissertation. I, I was testing um, competing models of response to loss, so a model in which one might stay depressed. It would be a very significant loss and you would feel awful and then you'd stay depressed over time. Or the popular model, um, uh, somewhat advocated by Kubler-Ross was we go through these stages and then eventually over time we're okay. And then the model that I was really curious about was more of a, of a cyclical um, response that, that certainly things do improve but they can um, get very difficult again at a moment's notice. It may be a smell or a, a sight and, and um, that actually was the predominant model um, by people with various forms of loss that, that helped me with my dissertation research. So that was um, a very interesting time. And I, I thought in the spirit of showing you um, where I've lived, uh, sort of a travel log, this was a picture that was right outside the backyard of our house in Tucson. And it was um, absolutely beautiful with the saguaro cacti, and I totally mispronounced them when we first moved there, saguaro or something, and the, the mover said, lady, <laughs> you're going to have to get this right, it's saguaro. So, and, and during the monsoon seasons, the, the, the arroyos would fill up with water, and you'd hear this, this incredible sound. You wanted to stay out of it with you if you were driving. But, um, wonderful sound of the water rushing by and then and then it would be gone and things would um, dry out and then stay very dry for a while but um, a beautiful place to live and to think and reflect and to study and so I really had a great opportunity to complete my doctoral work at U of A in, in Tucson. So after I finished that, um, like all of us, you know, we get to a certain point and, and have to make a decision. And I was fortunate enough to have um, three job offers in Tucson. And, and so I'm sitting there one day kind of reflecting about the three job offers and which one, and they all sounded interesting. And, um, but I was flipping through a, actually a hard copy, I know it's archaic now, a hard copy of Nursing Research, the, the journal that we um, all get in one form or another. And at the back of the journal, there was an advertisement. Dr. Clifford, you may have placed that advertisement. I, I'm not sure. But an advertisement for tenure-track faculty at the University of Kansas. And in the spirit of moving east, um, it was time to consider somewhere east. I didn't exactly know what tenure-track faculty meant, but I called them up and, and um, got an interview and so was able to um, come to see the university and at that time we were in the building next door and so we didn't ha yet have this lovely building but the the opportunities that were presented at the University of Kansas School of Nursing at that time were so intriguing to me that I, I said to my family, let's try Kansas. We, we haven't been there we, and we like adventure and, and so we were on the road to Kansas and here we have our, our new building and the time that I have spent here um, has been absolutely wonderful and as I, I said in a meeting the other day that um, there has only been the very rare day that I don't wake up and really look forward to coming to work. There are so many interesting questions to ask and, and problems to solve and people to meet and connections to make and it is an incredible place to be. And so when I got here I figured out that being on the tenure track meant a lot of stress. <laughs> that there was the expectation for developing a research team, um, meeting all sorts of people, getting funding, getting um, published, um, teaching, learning how to teach at that same time, 
learning how to be on committees. Um, all of that was pretty new to me because in the student role, even though you do feel very busy, you are pretty protected as a student. And moving into that tenure track position um, is, is a time for lots of learning going on. And so I did reach that first milestone of getting tenured and, and being promoted to associate professor. And from there, continue to develop um, ideas around for studies around this notion of human response to significant loss. But now I've moved into um, the intervention phase. And so we developed a self care talk uh, intervention that we, um, oh, Dr. Rawich. Oh. <laughs> His phone is talking to us, so <laughs> this self care talk will be for you. <laughs> that um, it, we, we used to, to teach family caregivers of persons um, uh, with dementia or, or on some sort of, of onset of, of neurologic uh, disorder um, could use to help them in their caregiving roles. So it was helping guide them through that process of building on self strengths and reaching out to the community because many times um, family caregivers, we as nurses or as healthcare providers, it's really easy to say to somebody, be sure to take care of yourself. And then they say okay, obligatorily, and leave, and but don't know what that means. And and feel very guilty if they're um, moving, you know, taking a night off from their loved one and, and going out to do something or going shopping by themselves or and so this, this idea of take care of yourself has to be, uh, has to include some, some content, some suggestions, some guidance about how that can happen. And so that was, was my clinical, has been my clinical research, area of research for quite some time. Um, as I uh, have spent more time in the School of Nursing, I've had a number of leadership opportunities arise. And with those leadership opportunities came also opportunities for a different type of research, more of an educational um, type of research. So, so that's then what I've been um, really focused on in the last several years is we first started um, a project looking at types of clinical education models that are used in undergraduate programs in the United States. And so working with two colleagues, we went to um, several schools of nursing and followed their students and their clinical faculty to different sites um, to observe and to interview um, the, the nurses, the students, the staff nurses, the faculty, um, about what was going on in this clinical education. And one of the interesting terms that one of the students, well, a, a student said it and then everybody else chimed in, was, well, there's an awful lot of wall time. And I imagine when I say that term, wall time, it probably conjures up an image of just what the students were trying to express, that they lean against a wall. They're not really doing much in the clinical setting for sometimes much of that clinical rotation. And so obviously that's not what we want. We, when students go out to a clinical site, regardless of the level, whether they're undergraduate or graduate, we want them to have a rich um, experience. We want them to be learning. We don't want them to be s supporting the wall, except maybe to catch a breath. Um, so, so that idea of best models for clinical education or how we might transform clinical education has, has really captured my interest in the last few years. I've had the good fortune of serving on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Evaluating Innovations in Nursing Education um, group for several years, and we reviewed applications, um, then, then would bring in successful applicants and review them again and give them ideas about before they started the project, and then after they completed the project, we'd review it again. Um, for uh, ide additional ideas for dissemination of findings. And, and so that continues to reinforce um, my 
curiosity about best models of education. Uh, I, I don't know that we have found the answers for best models for education, and we're still working on that, as, as many of you in the room are every day. So I appreciate your efforts in that area, and I, I join you alongside. So one of the other um, stops that I wanted to make past the School of Nursing was a relatively recent move, and you might recognize where this fountain is. Anybody know where that is? Loose Park. Well, when we first moved here, we lived in Stillwell, and that was um, lovely. We got to have an Arabian horse and you know do all the farm thing, but it was also about an hour south, and that, that took up a lot of time. And, and <clears throat> so one day, my husband and I are driving around the city, and I said, you know, it, it might be easier if we moved closer into the med center, shorten the drive, and, and we could buy a house like that house over there um, that happened to have a for sale sign in the yard. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then we kept driving. Did, a couple of weeks later, I'm at a Sigma Theta Ta dinner. I'm probably, some of us were at a table together. Yes, Dr. Clifford, you remember, I'm at a Sigma Theta Ta induction dinner. I get a text from my husband. Usually I don't check those, but something told me I needed to check this one. Remember the house that you pointed out? <laughs> Just bought it. <laughs> so we, we then, I, I thought of putting a picture, before picture of the house, but it was so awful I didn't want to go in. So that was a year and a half project to, to make that nice. And, and as those of you who might be um, running or walking by Loose Park, if you happen to come by our house, please feel free to knock and we'll share coffee or wine or whatever might be appropriate for the moment. Um, but, but yet another state, Missouri. So with that, I wanted to talk about some of the projects that um, we, many of you in this room, and I have been working on over the last few years. Um, one is the Kansas Action Coalition. Now, five years ago, um, the Institute of Medicine released the Future of Nursing report. And in that report, there are eight major recommendations. And those recommendations are things like nurses should have more education to prepare them to be leaders in, in the changes needed for our healthcare system. Or 80% um, uh, uh, of our nurses should be prepared at the baccalaureate level by 2020. Or we should double, and these are not ors, these are ands, and we should double the number of nurses with a doctorate by 2020. We should get data about our workforce so we know who we are and where we are and what we're doing so we can benchmark these improvements and in a number of others. And <clears throat> so in the um, thinking about how this would move forward from just the recommendations in this report to actually action, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation partnered with AARP in creating the campaign for action in which each state would have an action coalition to move these ideas forward. And the action coalitions would be comprised of nurses, and the original term was non-nurses. We've advocated for the term nurse champion, and now that is, is being used nationally too. So we've got nurses and nurse champions working together to advance these recommendations from the IOM report. In Kansas, our action coalition, the nurse partners are KU School of Nursing, Pittsburgh State, Wichita State, and Fort Hayes State. And our nurse champion is KU Hospital. So we have um, a very strong group to work together through um, different teams, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a leadership team, a Dr. Ford. Um, Dr. Ford is one of the co-leads of the leadership team. We have a practice team, and Dr. Busenhardt, are you here? Dr. Busenhardt is co-lead of the practice team. And we have an education team, which is being co-led by um, nurse educators in, uh, from the other schools. And then we have a new, relatively new, in the last year, an advocacy team, which is co-led by Dr. Jill Peltzer, who is back here. And so we work on a number of projects um, through the Action Coalition related to this Future of Nursing report. 
But one of the projects started with asking the simple question, um, the goal is to have 80% baccalaureate prepared by 2020. This is exciting news. You hear this going on out here? This is. Um, and, and so our question is, well, where are we now? Um, what's, what is the educational level of nurses in Kansas now? And so it turns out that those data are, are not, don't exist. And the Board of Nursing collects data about educational level of nurses at time of initial licensure, but uh, when nurses get additional education, that's not recorded in the database. So we, if we look at the original database of at time of initial licensure, it looks like about 48% of nurses in Kansas are prepared at the baccalaureate level. 48% where we are now, 80% is the goal in only five years. Well, that, that would be a long way to go. We wondered about the accuracy of that, and so we worked with the Kansas Department of Labor and Kansas Department of Commerce and also the Kansas State Board of Nursing to create and distribute a Kansas RN workforce survey. That had never been done before, and I'm, how many of you in this room participated last year? Oh, great, lots. Okay, well, you and 7,000 of your closest friends also participated. So we got a, a reasonably good response rate with over 7,000, right about 7,000. Dr. Shen was the primary investigator on this and she knows the exact numbers. Um, but we got almost 7,000 participants who compared to the, the basic sample of the um, RN population. And what we found was that in in Kansas, in fact, we have 60% of our nurses prepared at the baccalaureate level. So we're a lot further along towards that goal than one might have originally thought. So that was a very important thing to, to find out. And what we're now doing is working with the State Board of Nursing to try and, and move this into a regular thing that nurses do at time of license renewal every other year. And so we're, we're just about there. They've, they've said now it's an important thing to do, and now we're down to how to do it. So we've made some really great progress. Another um, study that we did was to identify leadership needs, interests, needs, and goals, and barriers that nurses in Kansas have related to this notion of, of preparing for and taking on leadership roles in particularly in the state. And so in that survey, Dr. Ford, we had about 1,000 nurses participate. And of those 1,000 who participated, about two-thirds said that, yes, they would like to have more leadership positions, but they needed help. They, they needed help in skill development. So we used the data from that study to then design the Kansas Nurse Leadership Residency Program in collaboration with Dr. Brian Selig from KU Hospital. Dr. Selig um, recently earned his DNP from uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and as part of his DNP education, he developed a great leadership program. And so we're using that as the foundation for what we're going to be offering across Kansas. Now, we're building on the foundation of that leadership program, but extending it across the state. So not only will Kansas City nurses participate, but also nurses in the Pittsburgh area, the Wichita area, and the Hayes area. And each one of those cities will have teams of nurses from acute care, from long-term care, from school health, and from public health. The acute care gets a lot of attention in general as far as different programs that are available, different learning opportunities. But the other areas are very important to public health, the health of our citizens. Um, but there are comparatively fewer leadership opportunities for nurses in those areas. So we're involving nurses from all of those areas in each one of these cities. And right now, we've got specialists from each one of the areas who are reviewing the curriculum and giving us feedback so we can make sure that we've got the right curriculum for this program. And then we have regional uh, coordinators at each side who are going to supervise that educational experience for the nurses. 
We hope to start by September, October, September or October, and the program will take about a year, and then the graduates will have additional skills in uh, leading in their specialty areas, in their communities. So this is a grant that's funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and also um, with contributions from the REACH Foundation and the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City. So we're well funded by um, local and national foundations to do this work and the need for the work is based on the evidence that we've um, gathered from the community. So. We also got funding to do a summit to help build cultural competency skills of nurses in Kansas. And this is a photograph with um, Dr. Peltzer and I um, and the two of the guest speakers who were supported by the RWJ to come and, and talk with us about access issues nationally and also um, diversity and, and skills for building cultural competence. Um, one of the activities we had during this, this summit, which was just a um, week and a half ago, um, was uh, Dr. Peltzer organized a, an interactive theater troupe. And so they came and, and it was a difficult dialogue, um, was the, the topic for their um, play. And they did about six minutes of, of a play of students talking about this faculty hire this, uh, that they thought maybe was unfair. And then the faculty member walked into the room and what was the faculty member to do? How, was, how were they to, to respond? And so the, the play went on and then um, there was discussion and then we did the play again and then nurses were invited, or the attendees were invited to interrupt and go up and, and try to do a better job than, than the actor. And so it was just a fascinating way to think about these issues and actually practice some of the language and, and feel some of the discomfort that may, may exist when you're trying to work through something that's new or challenging. So that just happened. I wanted to share that with you. Now, the other big collaborative that we have in the state that, that some of you are involved with, and I wanted to make sure that others of you knew about it, is the Kansas Advanced Practice Collaborative. And in this collaborative, the, the faculty who teach the family nurse practitioner students here, like, like Dr. Moya Peterson over there, um, they work with the faculty from the Pittsburgh State University and Fort Hayes State University. And they get together on the phone every week and they talk about the products that they're developing for the students to use in their learning, the outcome assessments and you know, what could be improved. The, the modules are peer reviewed so that they continue to improve each year. And then we get together twice a year for in-person meetings. And so what this collaborative does is help build the skills of everybody. Um, all of the faculty across the state um, who are teaching in these three FNP programs can learn from each other. And they can test ideas with each other. They can t um, challenge each other with facts sometimes or approaches. And so it's an opportunity certainly for the faculty to learn from one another. The students then benefit from having the expertise of all levels of faculty uh, from across the schools and across the state. And so it's a cooperative that we've had in place for a number of years. And each year we graduate about 80 students through that advanced practice collaborative and about a dozen or so faculty are involved. So it's, it's um, an incredible process and, and way that faculty have demonstrated the willingness and the interest to work with one another to help build skills and to share expertise. So that, that brings me to where I am here and some of my experiences and some of the things that I think are going to be very important for us as we um, continue to move forward. Um, clearly, education is one of our driving uh, missions. It's the reason we're here it is to educate, one of the reasons we're here is to educate students to provide great care to our citizens. And so our interesting challenge that we have right now is how do we actually 
enact that, that goal, that ideal of interprofessional education. The evidence is building that when patients are cared for by highly functioning interprofessional teams, that the outcomes are better. And, and so we have that as a goal. We know that, that patient outcomes are better. We focus on the patient. Okay, now how do we get from here to there? We, we all have long histories of fairly um, independent, uh, if not the, um, people often use the word siloed, educational approaches, and that won't work anymore. We can see in the future that that is not going to work anymore. And so how can we make that change? How can we meaningfully educate our students for interprofessional work so that they are prepared for interprofessional collaborative practice when they complete their programs. So it's really requiring both at, at the same time, us figuring out the interprofessional education side, but also us helping our colleagues in the community to develop practices that are conducive to interprofessional collaborative practice. So those are as, as we all know, um, challenges and opportunities for us, and, and I think it'll be an interesting problem to solve. And what, what a great opportunity, knowing that this building is gonna be across the, the street in two years. We've got a couple of years to figure this out and to, to work with each other and to um, brainstorm together, take advantage of where we are already and build on that. RWJ has just done a pretty exhaustive study of best practices for interprofessional teams, and, and that report does emphasize the, the organizational support is necessary for IPE to, to meaningfully occur, and the importance of building on what's already happening. So um, thank you to all of you who are already participating, and, and with simulation too, we'll continue to build beyond that. So in practice, I've mentioned the importance of the patient focus um, as the, the reason for doing all of this. And so uh, there is some beginning work in this area is to work with our colleagues in, in the community to develop practice settings that are conducive to interprofessional teams. And that's gonna be really important for our future and take all of us, including um, School of Nursing, School of Health Professions, and School of Medicine um, to figure that out. Research, um, in the School of Nursing, building our research portfolio overall is certainly a goal that we have. It's a, it's a necessity for us. Um, and one of the ways that we have an opportunity to do that now, which is really unique, is the, the national focus on big data and the concurrent availability of some incredible faculty, like who are right back here, um, Dr. Olds and Dr. Kramer, um, and Dr. Dutton, who have recently been transitioning from NDNQI and are very familiar with um, working with not only large data sets, but disparate data sets, and, and being able to answer some of those um, previously in unanswerable questions because it required access to data we didn't have, but now those data sets are being created, and so it gives up us an opportunity to be able to ask some of the very difficult questions that we hadn't been able to in the past. Developing that as a, as a center of excellence around that concept is certainly something that, that we have the ability to do and will be of great use to the rest of the country and figuring this out. And then in the community, um, I, I've already mentioned the importance of building competencies and cultural um, awareness, and that's never an, an end journey. We're, we're never there. We consistently need to be working on and, and building those um, competencies. But the engagement with the community in a variety of ways, like um, through Dr. Baird's research is a great example of working with the community to um, figure out ways that we can um, be helpful to an entire community. Really that time is definitely now for our future. So those are just a few of the ideas that I have um, for where we might go in the future and also a brief outline of my past of what brought me west to east 
And um, at this time, I want to thank you for, for sharing my story and invite any questions that you might have. That's right, you're, you're all my friends. Dr. Aronson. Thank you. Um, given that uh, clearly you're very familiar with us and with KU, which is, is lovely, so in, in that context, what, what, would, what do you see um, also more broadly as among the biggest challenges facing schools of nursing today that you would need to grapple with as a dean? Well, actually, one of the biggest challenges has to do with our own faculty. Um, we have, uh, in schools of nursing across the country, uh, this story is very similar, and, and also at different levels, that we have very dedicated faculty. They do a terrific job. Um, however, we have a, a, a pretty prominent need to be bringing new faculty into our schools to teach them how to teach and to capture that wisdom from people who are getting ready to retire. We, um, reti blooming retirements um, is one of the challenges that's facing all schools of nursing. On behalf of the Kansas Association of Colleges of Nursing, I'm um, leading a study now on faculty retirement in Kansas since we can't really ask those questions as individuals, but we can across the state um, ask about uh, plans for retirement and, and succession planning and so on because that's a critical issue for all of us. How do we um, make sure that we have faculty um, who are prepared to teach the new generations of nurses. So that's one of the critical issues. Dr. Wambach. Thank you, Dr. Teal, um, sharing your story of your journey to here. And um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about your ideas and thoughts on the funding situation in the state of Kansas, because that is a big issue and a challenge as well. It is. Um, those of you who have been with the school for the last several years have, have experienced our constrained financial um, environment it has been going on for a while, and that likely will continue. So one of the things that we really need to think about is given that it's unlikely we'll have increased funds from the state, what to support the, the goals that we have. What are the other ways of bringing in revenue to the school um, that might support some of the ideas that, that we have? And so some of the different options that we would have would be um, philanthropy, so working with um, people in the community who might be interested in supporting, for example, our a doctoral student. We, compared to other schools, we have very, very my, minimal, minuscule support available for our doctoral students. And some other programs have full support for doctoral students. So through um, perhaps philanthropy, um, some, an individual might be, or corporation, might be interested in supporting one or more doctoral students, for example. Um, another way of bringing in revenue would be to create services that others will then come to us and pay for. So for example, if we create a, a center for big data and offer those kinds of, um, uh, say, week-long residencies, people around the country want that, but doctoral students and faculty and, and our whole um, community want that kind of information, and that would be something that we could generate revenue from. We already are a member of Nexus, and that's a, a doctoral uh, exchange program, if you will, where uh, there are about 20 programs involved now, and we share access to our doctoral courses with one another. And so those students, um, as they come to take our doctoral courses, which they love, we have a, a very high enrollment in our courses compared to other schools, 
because we do so well at that. Um, but that generates some revenue too. Um, consulting is another option, as, as is um, developing their different models coming into the marketplace for um, marketing online programs and sharing revenue. And so there are a number of different revenue generating um, opportunities that we would need to consider. What I think the, the answer is not just one thing. It's going to be clearly a multifactorial um, effort in, in order for us to meet our goals because we don't want to constrain our creativity. That's really important to me. We, we have a, a very innovative school and faculty and, and we want to encourage that freedom of thought and creativity of ideas to grow. So finding financial resources to support that is important. And of course, through, um, should, should we be so lucky, NIH funding. So Dr. Bozak, we're counting on you. So, Dr. Gerard. of the state relative to that and then then along those same lines as as um, the preeminent institution in the state uh, what's our role relative to the other programs across the state and what challenges would what unique challenges are they facing mm -hmm. compared to what what we face so the question Dr. Gerard asked um, was how do we compare the workforce study findings to other states in the country and then what's our role within our state? And so uh, interestingly enough, when, when we published these findings in Nursing Outlook, they wanted to know the same thing too. So how did we um, compare with other states? And Dr. Shen, I'm looking to you because the what was the primary finding on that? So compared to our region, at 60% um, baccalaureate prepared in Kansas, we were higher than other states within our region. So that was a, a very important finding. We're further along that path than our neighboring states. Within our state, um, this is a, a really interesting question because as you know, we have lots of, of nursing programs. We have practical nursing programs, associate degree programs, baccalaureate programs, graduate programs. How do we talk to each other? And what is KU's role in that conversation? And, and what we have been able to do is clearly our role is a, a flagship um, institution in the state. And we have been able to um, acknowledge that role and the responsibility that goes along with being a flagship institution, but without disengaging our colleagues across the state. And so they typically turn to us for innovations in undergraduate um, education, in R and BSN education, and in graduate education, but turn to us knowing that we will be partners in, in helping them develop their programs too. For example, in the Advanced Practice Collaborative with the schools at Pittsburgh and Fort Hayes, um, there we all started out with master's level FNP programs. And in 2013, KU moved to a DNP level. And so it left the question of now what are we going to do? Are we going, some of our students would be being prepared at the master's level, while others would be being prepared at the doctoral level. That doesn't quite seem like it's going to work, but yet we, we worked with our colleagues and and they eventually decided that what they wanted to do is to try and change the entire system at PSU and Fort Hayes. And so they did a proposal to their school. They, the proposal went to the Board of Regents and has been approved. Now, both PSU and Fort Hayes are offering the DNP. PSU starts this fall. Fort Hayes will start next fall. The reason that's so critically important is that neither 
institution was a doctoral degree granting institution before this effort. Now both of them are doctoral degree granting institutions because of the efforts of uh, the School of Nursing and the respective um, areas of the state. We provided the, the encouragement, the support. The, um, Dr. Ford and I went to um, Pittsburgh to do site visit and as they were preparing their application, help them think of creative ways of partnering with other doctorally prepared people within the university um, to build the depth on, on their bench of resources. And so that, that is changing. The, certainly the culture of those those institutions, which is critical to the, the changing what's happening in that whole community, and it's changing then our state and moving towards higher levels of education. So uh, KU School of Nursing has done an incredible job in leading the state in advancing educational reform. So I'm really happy to report that activity. Other questions? Ah, Dr. Wilson. First, I want to say that was a great presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, or have you talk a little bit about the staff role. It, mm -hmm. of course, has evolved over the years. And so um, you'll be responsible in the dean role to, or for leading and managing and then addressing the developmental needs of a large number of staff. So I just want to have you share a few thoughts on that. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Wilson, for raising that point, because you're right. It, this is not just about faculty or, or students. Um, it's about all of us, including the staff and the community in which we um, live and work. And as, as I think it was um, uh, Helen Connor said to me a long time ago, she said, you know, we are an educational institution. We sh value learning. And that learning isn't something that's just available to the students who pay tuition. That really should be a value that we have for all of us, for ourselves, our staff, for all of us. That to make a strong institution requires all of us to be thinking constantly about what, what more would I like to learn? For to, example, today, I did this Prezi. I've never done a Prezi before. Um, I, I thought I'd take a chance in what better circumstance than among friends. Um, so, so that willingness to try new things, to experiment, to learn, um, whether it's through, uh, I remember when you did a Six Sigma training, um, uh, that commitment to, to do that several month training, or whether it's a, an, you know, an hour over lunch hour learning how to use a new piece of software, or whether I, I went back for a three year leadership training with RWJ. Um, it, there are various types of, of learning opportunities that are available to all of us all the time, and I would think it, it's vital that all of us stay thinking about how can we continue to develop? And so that includes faculty and students and staff. So thank you for raising that question. You're welcome. Yeah, it worked.